start recording. Okay. So, what do you guys want me to do? Because we just got a homework assignment due. So, what, do you want to go over that one? Or does everybody think, okay, we got it. We don't have to talk about it. And move on to new topics. It's up to you. Okay. All right. We can go over. The recursion one? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the recursion one is, um, let's see, right here, recursive calls. And the source code is here. That's why I come to this point here. And there's also, in the announcement, there's also an attachment, a zip file that you can unzip. You get both the C version as well as the assembly you know, starting point. So I would hope that most people start with that one. So I'm going to start with this one and start with fib-1, which is the zip file that I created the other day. And I'm just verifying that we are indeed recording. So that's good. All right, so now we switch to a command line interface like this one. Make it wider so we can see both the C code and the assembly code. <clears throat> and let me pick a window here. All right. All right, so can everybody read this point, or do I do you want it to be slightly bigger? Is that readable? Is readable? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to unzip the file first. So unzip fib-1, and we'll overwrite the other files. Okay, yes, and yes, there we go. Okay, so now we can take a look at both the C code, fib.c, and also the assembly code, which is fib.ttpasm, at the same time, side by side. So instead of implementing the second version of uh, Fibonacci, which is from ni line 9 to line 19, I'm going to go for the first one. So I would just implement the, sim the, the simpler one that is more difficult to understand, which is the one on from line 4 to line 7. All right. <clears throat> So for the time being, we can ignore this one. This is not what I am going to implement. So the function in main is also going to call f and not f1 because I'm implementing the first um, representation. All right, so on this side, we have the C code. And the C code is, for the most part, done except for the function Fibonacci. And this is the point where I gave it to you, which basically means I'm giving you a 27. It returns a constant of 27, just to make sure that we got into it and we can double check everything that is on the stack. So we're going to take out this, and now we have to implement the actual function. So to implement the actual function, as usual, what I usually do is I draw myself a picture of the stack of what I expect to be on the stack at this point of the program execution. I'm moving my monitor a little closer because my these glasses can only see about arm's length and not the infinite distance one. <clears throat> and also, as usual, I define my local variables or labels. So f underscore n is going to be the offset from where the stack pointer points to to local var to uh, parameter n. So um, there are a few ways to do this. You can always start with the return address. In the absence of local variables, the stack pointer points directly to the return address. But if you go for the second implementation, then a stack pointer will be pointing to return value, which is a local variable. So in this case, f underscore return address 1 plus, because the parameter is one byte after the return address on the stack. So do we have any questions about how I define the labels so I can access items on the stack? Okay, no particular questions, okay? So in this case, because I don't have any local variables, I don't have to allocate for the space, nor do I have to deallocate for the space. So I'm good here. So I can start with the actual implementation of the code at this point. The first thing I need to do is to access n and see if it is less than 2. So that means I need to get the value of n, which is our parameter. So to do that, there's a certain template now. I hope most of you recognize the template. Is We put the label, which is representing the offset from where the stack pointer points to, to the thing that we want to access. And then we just add the stack pointer back to it. So now we have the address. Then we have the value of n at this point on line 47. So now I can compare that to 2. So I need to do an LDI 
um, B2, okay, because you know, I cannot compare directly to an immediate. There's no CMPI instruction. And now I can do the actual compare. So when I do the compare, I have to kind of think about which way do I want to compare. Um, do I want to compare? If you look at this as a conditional statement, I am actually looking for an excuse to go to the else statement, which is over here. So that's one way to look at it. I'm looking for the case where n is greater than or equal to 2. So that means you know, we have to reverse the comparison. So we have to subtract A from B and then do a J um, C I in this case because it is unsigned to the label where it corresponds to the else value. So we go to else value here, J Z I also to else value. The reason why we have both of these is because it is um, we want uh, register A, which is N, to be uh, greater than or equal to 2 in order to get to the else value according to the original C logic. Does that make sense? Okay, because if n is not less than 2, what does that mean? It means n is greater than or equal to 2, which also means 2 is less than or equal to n, and that's why we arrange the uh, comparison this way. Yes? I am indeed recording. Um, the screen is good. The voice is good. Yep. <laughs> All right. So now, if I do not go to L's value, if I continue execution here, this is where the then value is going to be computed. But there's nothing to compute because you know, the then value is simply n itself. Because when n is less than 2, we just return n. So that means register A already has what we need. So that means uh, we don't have anything else to do here. We have to go to the, <clears throat> the uh, end of the ternary expression. So I'll just say end ternary expression like that. So now this is where I define L's value, which is you know, where we will perform the recursive call and add the sum uh, to compute the sum of the recursive calls. There are two calls. <clears throat> the first one is calling with n being um, with the parameter, the argument being n minus one. The second one is with the parameter of n minus two. So we'll go ahead and do this. Okay. So at this point, we know a already has the value of n because you know, we needed that in order to evaluate the condition here. So that means uh, to get to n minus one is simply to decrement a, okay? That means a now has n minus one. And then we just have to push it on the stack, push the return address, and then recursively call f. So now we just need to decrement d, s, t, d, a, which is pushing the value of a, which is n minus one at this point. Um, and then we do a ldi a dot six plus, <clears throat> decrement d, s, t, d, a, that is pushing the return address. So you can push everything on the stack, but you have to remember to continue execution at the subroutine. This is how we continue execution at the subroutine f. And when it returns, we have the return value in register a, but at the same time, we would have the extra argument that is sitting on the stack. We have to clean that up. So increment d will clean up that extra argument byte on the stack. <clears throat> so this is the problem. The problem here is I need to call f again to get to f of n minus 1. But somebody has to remember the return value of f of n minus 1. How are we going to do it? So the solution to this is actually in one of your labs. Okay? In one of your labs, I think uh, a function returns the value of 5, and then we call that twice, and then we add up the, the return values of both of those. That already demonstrated the technique of how to do this. Okay. So if you have noticed that particular trick when you were doing the lab, then you would know how to deal with this one. <clears throat> Whenever you need to save something, like save a particular value for later, do not save it in the register if you're planning to call a subroutine again. Because part of the agreement between the caller and the callee is the callee is not responsible to preserve the values of the registers, A, B, and C. So that means you cannot assume the subroutine, you know, in this case, you know, F itself, is going to preserve the value of register A, B, or C. Register A is a given that it's going to change because it is the return value. Register B or C cannot be assumed that they're, going to, they're not going to be changed when you call the subroutine. So that means at this point, we're going to have to <clears throat> put it somewhere else. Where else can I put something that cannot be touched by a subroutine? <clears throat> 
the stack. Very good. <clears throat> yes, I am recording. The voice is good. The video is good too. Thank you for reminding. All right, so we push it on the stack, which means we decrement in D again, STDA. So this is pushing the return address of F of N minus one on the stack. So we can use it later, okay? So now we are setting up for the second call to um, <clears throat> F, which is F of N minus two. So we, the first thing we need to do is to get back to N. Then you go like, but we had that earlier in register A and we push it on the stack as an argument. Can't we just pop it from the stack? The answer is no. There's no guarantee in this case that the subroutine is not modifying the parameter either. Now, in C and C++, you can use const all you want, but there is still no guarantee because you know, the subroutine itself can recast a parameter from a const back to a non-const and then go ahead and change it. So that means I cannot rely on the argument that was sitting on the stack that was n minus one. There's no way I can assume that it is still n minus one sitting on the stack before the decrement of line 66. So what do we need to do? We have to do the whole thing again. So we have to do LDI A. I can reuse A now because A is already pushed on the stack. I have just saved the return value of F of N minus one. So I can use register A again. <clears throat> F of N, LDI AD, and then LDA A. So under normal circumstances, this would get the job done. Unfortunately, this is not a normal circumstance. Why? <clears throat> because we got this. Now, after the increment D, the stack pointer is pointing back to N again. But guess what we did after that? We got a decrement D on line 66. So that means the stack pointer is now pointing one byte below where it normally would when we computed the offset to the various items on the stack. So what do we do? We just have to say all the offsets are wrong. They're off, all off by one byte, and we adjust that. So you can do one of two things. You can do an increment D over here. I mean, increment A over here. You can do it that way, but you can also do a one plus over here. Either way works, okay? Because we just have to account for the extra byte that is sitting on the stack that we have done here. These two lines is pushing the return value on the stack. <clears throat> And that is why you need this one plus here. And then at this point, we can kind of, it's business as usual. So we have decrement A, decrement A, because we need N minus two this time, since A already has N on line 71. So decrement it twice is going to get N minus two. <clears throat> and then at that point, we can push that on the stack, decrement D, STDA. So now we have pushed N minus two on the stack getting ready for the second call of F. So that means uh, we have LDIA dot six plus, this is our return address, decrement D STDA, which is pushing the return address. And now we can call the subroutine F again. When it comes back, we have the increment D again to get rid of the extra item that is sitting on the stack. So at this point of time, we are anticipating that we have the return value of f of n minus one still sticking on the stack. It is saved on the stack. <clears throat> and then we have the return value of f of n minus two sitting in register A at this point. So we have to add those two, right? So the first thing we need to do is to pop <clears throat> the return value of f of n minus one from the stack to one of the registers. B or C are fine. So let's do that, okay? Increment, oh, LD first, LD, BD, and then increment D, this is, popping reg this is popping the return value of F of N minus one from the stack to register B, okay? So at this point, we have register B having the return value of F of N minus one, register A having the return value of F of N minus, N minus two. So now we can add those two together. <clears throat> Whenever you perform an add, you can choose add BA or add AB, but let me answer that question first. Go ahead. Um, line 70, what again? Which line? 70. 69. You mean this line? 
the next one? Oh, it's a add. You, you're correct. Add AD. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so getting back to where we were, right. So we're going to do add AB because you know, we need the sum to be in register A because that is part of the, that is the return value. So since we have to move the sum into register A anyway, might as well just do the add instruction and put it into register A directly. Is that okay so far? So once again, I'm not commenting anything in this program so that you can. All right? Yep, go ahead. Question? Nope, okay. So I need one more label here because you know, the jump around is needs to land here. So let me go back to the jump around is end turn. Okay, so end turn has to be put here. End turn. End of the ternary expression has to go here. And at that point, we simply do a normal return to the caller. All right. So I have done something that I would I tell you guys not to do, which is to write a whole bunch of lines of code and without testing it at all. <clears throat> so let's see whether this works or not. Okay. So before we run it, we also need to know what we are supposed to see. Okay. If you think, okay, tech, you probably got it right. So what are we supposed to see at the end of this entire program? We are supposed to see the Fibonacci um, number for sequence for the se for number three, you know, um, in the on the stack, not on the stack, in register A by the time we get to line 24, which is also going to be stored in the local variable X of main. And main is already done, okay? So main has a local variable X already allocated. The whole thing about main is already done, okay? We, I demonstrated that um, before I gave you the code, the template code. So that means, you know, um, location. Okay, so now this is your turn to kind of think about how is the stack going to be used. I think we illustrated that a little bit on the other day. <clears throat> Did anyone take a look at the stack picture before starting to work on this? Nobody. A little bit? Sorry? Say again? What picture? I thought we talked about the stack diagram. Maybe not, huh? Okay. All right. So, but this is something that you can also do for yourself is to think about how is the stack going to be used. And let me start up the, um, Uh oh, I didn't do it. Do it again. Huh. <clears throat> All right. Let's do that one more time. There we go. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at what is supposed to be on the stack. <clears throat> this is location FF, this is FE, and so on. So we have to take a look at the program first because I cannot remember the, the program itself. So let's take a look at the program, which is here. <clears throat> if I remember correctly, this is the one where we, train, we treat main as a normal subroutine, so it has its own return address. So that is, you know, just confirm that. All right, so this is a return address here. Oop, you guys cannot see it because I <clears throat> forgot to switch this screen. So at location FF is a return address from main back to the entry code, okay? That's where it, what it's supposed to do. And then we have local variable X, you know, sitting here. This is the local variable X of main. This together is the call frame for main because it sets up the return address for main to go back to the entry code and it also has the local variable of main at this point. And then what we do is we push three on the stack <clears throat> because that's the argument and then we push another return address which is from F back to main in order to call the subroutine F, okay? 
So this is your, this is the call frame for the first invocation of f. We're going to have a few of these. <clears throat> and then f is going to call um, f again. So this is where it gets a little bit harder to visualize because the first call is going to take up these two bytes. Okay, so this is the first call of the recursive call of f, where you know, we, we have a two here. And then when that is done, we are going to end up with something a little bit different. So this is where you know you cannot really visualize things by looking at a static picture, because when we are done with the first call, then we push the return value of f of n minus one, which is which means f of two is going to be stored at this location, and then at that point we're going to call f of one, okay. So f of one is going to call it's going to be called with one pushed here, and then the return address is going to be here. This is the second call. Um, so that's what we're supposed to see when we are calling, when we are at this entry point of the second recursive call from F itself. Okay, I'm not sure whether that is clear or not. <clears throat> and that's the most space we're going to use up on the stack. Um, nope, I take it back because F of 2 is going to have its own recursive call. Um, so that's going to take up you know, some more space. But eventually, you know, everything goes back to the first invocation, and we should store a value of 2 into x of main, because the Fibonacci number of 3 is 2. Are we doing OK so far with all that stuff? OK. No questions, or you guys are contemplating? If you are to test this program, would you test this program the way that I'm doing it right now, starting with f of three? Okay, go ahead. Zero, right? F of zero would be a good one to test because it does not do recursion. F of one would be a good one to test because it doesn't involve recursion. Then you test with f of two, which is the only, the, the first value that requires a single level of recursion. And if that is successful, then you move on to f of three. So starting with f of three is not the best way to do it, okay? Unless you're filled with confidence that your program is gonna work, okay? Or you're running out of time and you just wanted to shortcut the entire development process. <clears throat> so I'm gonna you know, test it with f of three, you know, just to see if this is working or not. But I do have to emphasize this is not the best way to do it. All right, so this is for today. I'm going to skip that, and we'll use this window to go to um, River Spider. And if you have not set up to use River Spider yet at this point, you might want to consider doing it because all the future homework assignments for this week and the next is going to be quite intensive. Without the use of River Spider, it's going to be it's going to be pretty hard. All right, so there we go. <clears throat> because it, it, really, it really just saves you a lot of time. And there we go. Okay, so everything seems okay. So now we go to the assembler, which is here. And then we go to the analysis tab, which is you know, going to show us the actual trace. And I'm going to go all the way to the end. There's a, probably a shortcut key to do that but I'm just doing the old fashioned way of going all the way to the end. All right, so we ended up at a halt instruction. That's always good. The stack pointer is balanced. That's always good too, okay? The only question now is, are we storing a two into local variable X? The answer is yes. So I'm fairly confident that this program is working. So now is the time to test it with a higher Fibonacci number, which is going to take much longer because the amount of time is proportional to the number, um, two to the power of the number. So if you give it like two to, if you give it f of five, it's going to take um, two to the power of five, which is 32 amount of time compared to a non-recursive version, approximately. Okay, but it's good to test it with a higher number. So let's test it with five. And before we do that, we probably want to find out what is Fibonacci of five. <clears throat> so the Fibonacci number of five is 
zero, one, two, three, four, five. It's five itself. Let's do six, okay? F of six should be eight. So let's do that. Okay, change the program a little bit. <clears throat> so now we go to the call and change that three to a six. <clears throat> and then we should see an eight stored in local variable X of main. And I cannot remember which one. This one is. Okay, there we go. So this is why you know, what, I, what I said a little bit earlier, it is good to set up your know, um, River Spider just because you know I can, you know, it's really easy to restart the whole thing and get a trace. <clears throat> so now we can go back to the um, assembler right here. And the trace got a little bit longer. So we have, it's a lot longer because it's, uh, okay. So this is where I need to use the trick to find out how long it is. It's 1,048 lines, so we have to go all the way to uh, 1,048, and I think that's a quick way to do it, like this. C 1,048. There we go. All right. So um, good news, okay? Because you know, we got halt being you know the the proper halt instruction. The stack pointer is balanced, and we want to know what is stored in location F E. And it is indeed eight. So this is what I would do to check whether the program is working or not. So is that okay? Yep. So I noticed you named the starting point you gave us. Mm -hmm. You actually named it once twice for storage value X. So it's just stored in location X and it's the X and it's the X. Um, so I'm just wondering why you picked those. Okay, so let's take a look at main. <clears throat> Okay, you mentioned decrementing x twice. I mean, decrementing. Decrement right up top underneath the label. Yeah. And then, right, you load immediate six and decrement e again by storing it. You mean here? Yeah. No, right above. Here? Yeah. I did store here. Yeah. But this is the one that did not store. I know, but you skip over x. Aren't you supposed to store x at x value in the No, no not yet. Because x is just declared here which means I'm just allocating the space for X, right. but I cannot store anything until I'm done with the function call to F. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know I have a single decrement D on line 15 just to reserve the space on the stack for local variable X. And until I have something to store, I'm just gonna leave that location uninitialized, right. which is what a, what a C program would have done as well. <clears throat> so that's kind of the general explanation of this program. And once again, I will give you guys the solution today. Okay, I'm gonna send it by announcement. And one of the things that you can do is to document it. Okay, you can add comments to the program. And as you add comments, remind yourself what which part corresponds to the caller callee agreement, when which part is a callee only thing, which is local variable X in this case, and also the tricks that I use in this case, like I saved the return value of f of n minus one on the stack, which as a result means everything is off by one byte, and that's why I needed to adjust for that later on. Okay, so that is your <clears throat> activity for you to do in order to kind of have a better understanding of you know, the topics that we are dealing with here. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> All right, so what we'll do next is to <clears throat> get on with uh, the topic for today, which is structures, okay? So we'll talk about structures today, and as usual, we're gonna start with a C program, and then we'll move on to the assembly implementation of the C program. So I'm just gonna say struct.c and struct.ttpasm, <clears throat> and it doesn't like that because I have one like that already. We can always delete that one, okay? So we can start again. Okay, so pound include s include cdint.h. All right, so we <clears throat> a structure is kind of like a class. Okay, it is a template. It defines certain members. Unlike a class, a structure cannot have methods. So it cannot call a specific method of a structure. It is only useful for storing things. <clears throat> So I'm just gonna call this structure itself X. So X is referring to the template. It's the name of the cookie cutter, not the name of the cookies that we are going to cut out of the cookie cutter. 
<coughs> which me, reminds me, for those of you who came in late, the previous class had a presentation and the professor brought in cookies. Um, you guys are welcome to have some cookies, you know, either now or later. <coughs> but the concept of cookie cutter is very important, okay? Because we are defining a cookie cutter right now. Yes. <coughs> they only have two pieces left. I believe these are chocolate chip cookies from Costco. Nope, it's from um, another place called Pumpkin. And then there are some donut holes or donut rounds, donut balls. It's the middle part of a donut. <coughs> All right. <clears throat> so we're going to have you know, a few items here, you know, unint, uh, unsigned integer age. Uh, we'll just call this X. <coughs> a semicolon. And then we have Y. And then we can have Z over here. Okay. And then we can define a subroutine. Okay, let's not do any subroutines just yet, okay? Instead, what we'll do is we'll just have a regular main. <clears throat> Inside, we have a local variable, which is of the type struct x. We'll call this, <clears throat> um, give it a name, hmm? number, numbers, coordinate, okay? Because that looks like a coordinate to me, you know, x, y, and z. So it's a 3D coordinate. <clears throat> And in here, we're going to say coord x equals to 5. <coughs> coord y is 7. <coughs> and then coord <coughs> z is 0. Yeah, let's make it a 1. <coughs> Return 0. Okay. So do we have any questions about the C code here? Are there any questions about what a structure is? And how do we access members inside the structure? So basically, X, Y, Z are called members inside anything of the type struct X. And in the main program, we have a local variable called coord, and it is going to access each one member, each one of those members, and initialize each one. So are we good so far? <clears throat> okay. So we'll go ahead and save the program and run it in C. So this is the usual thing that I do. I hope, hopefully it's not surprising anymore. And I'm just gonna pick a place where it is easier to access it. GCC-G-O struct struct.c. <clears throat> and then we'll go ahead and debug it. Okay, GDB struct. And then put a breakpoint on line 14 because we got a few things that we want to observe. So we run the program all the way up to line 14, which is before the first line that actually does anything with the members of coord. So we can now say, okay, let's print out coord. <clears throat> okay, these are all basically uninitialized, so don't ask me why x has an uninitial, uninitialized value of 127, and then zero for y, and also zero for x, for z. That's just you know, whatever memory has at that portion of the stack when I out when the C code allocated the space. <clears throat> but what I'm interested in is are the addresses. Okay. So I want to print out what is the address of coord itself. So focus on just the least significant three digits because the rest are not really that useful for us. So we we know that F3D is the beginning of the entire structure. So now we want to say, okay, if the structure is here, where are the in the members of this structure? So now we ask, what is the address of uh, coord dot x? It is at location three D itself. Okay, are you surprised that the beginning, the first member of the entire structure, is at the same address as the structure itself? Does that surprise you? No, kind of it's natural, right? Okay. So what about why? Remember y is one byte after that. What about z? It is one byte after y. Is that surprising to you? That they are contiguous and then it follows kind of the same order as the definition inside the structure. So none of that is really surprising, okay? But we are making this observation so that we can do something like this in assembly, okay? So now we continue with the program, okay? Single step, single step, single step. 
and then we print cohort again after the initialization. So now we have X being five, Y being seven, Z being one. Okay, that's kind of what we expected. Okay, so that's one program, okay, just to illustrate, you know, the basic idea of how to use structures in C, um, which is also the same way in C++. Yes? Uh, so the <clears throat> That's just the interpretation using ASCII code because we use a unsigned AB integer. So GDB is trying to be a smart ass and say, oh, you probably want to know what character is corresponding to which we don't. Mm -hmm. So a 10 would have been a backslash N because a line feed character has an ASCII code of 10. A 13 would have been a backslash R, which is a carriage return. A nine would have been a backspace. So it, that would have been a I think backslash B is representing a backspace. So it would have these you know, special names for the special characters in the ASCII code. But we don't really care about the things inside the single quotes. All right, so now we get out of the debugger and then we continue the coding because this time we want to code it in assembly language and see how it's going to look like. So in assembly language, we have the typical thing because we're treating main as if it is a normal function. So we have no op. LDID with zero, and then we just call main, LDIA with dot six plus, <clears throat> push it on the stack, like so, JMPI to main, and then after main returns, we have nothing else to do, which is a halt. So that means, you know, using this template, halt is always, always gonna be on line seven, okay? Unless I make some other changes, we can expect the program to go back to line seven when everything is done. All right, so now in main, I have a few things to do. First of all, is, um, is cord a local variable? Yes, it is. Uh, but tag, that means you know, it has to live on the stack. Yes, we do. Okay, we have to make cord to live on the stack. So when it lives on the stack, this is what it looks like. So it would take up three bytes because it has a Z, it has a Y, it also has an X. So all three members are living on the stack like this. And because these are local variables, or I should say this is a single local variable, but using three bytes. So that means when the stack, when the frame is set up, the return address is going to be at the highest location because that's pushed by the caller. The local variable, which is cohort, which has three bytes, is going to take up the three bytes below where the return address is. Okay, so this is what we want the frame to look like when everything is done, and then the stack pointer will point to here. So the question is, do we just say the three decrement Ds and be done with it, or is there a more systematic way of doing this? And the answer is always, there's a systematic way of doing this. So the first thing we need to do is to replicate the definition of the structure here. Now, syntactically speaking, there is no such thing as a structure in assembly language programming. And that is regardless of whether you're doing using the x86 assembler, whether using the you know um, TTP ASM. There's no such thing. It's a high-level concept. So what we can do instead is we can say, hey, if you want to access member X of the structure X, it is at the very beginning. It is the first member of the entire structure. If you want to access Y, it is the one thing after X. So it is whatever offset that you need to get to X plus one. Because the one plus has to do with the size of member X itself, which is only taking one byte in this case. It is a single unsigned AB integer. So now we can do something about the same with Z. It is one byte after member Y. And then we have one more item, which is the size of the entire structure. So that would be the last member plus the size of the last member. So now I have four label definitions just to designate where can I find each member given that I have the address of the entire structure and also what is the size of the entire structure. So this is how we quote unquote use a structure in assembly language programming. You have to define all of these labels. There is no syntact syntactical structure like this. You have to kind of go through this process. But it contains all the same information that we need in order to make use of a structure. So given all of that stuff here, now we're gonna say, okay, so we need to define some of these labels here. After the frame is allocated, 
we expect cohort as a single local variable to be at the place where the stack pointer itself is pointing to because we don't have any other local variables in this case. Okay, so that part is kind of normal. And then what we do is we now say, what about the total number of local variables? What about the total number of bytes that we need for local variables? So that would be local var size, okay? This is a typical label name that I use you know, to refer to the number of bytes that we need for all the local variables in a particular function. So in this case, it would just be main cohort, which is the last local and the only local variable for the offset to it, plus the size of it. The size of it is x underscore size. So this sum between where we find the last local variable and what is the size of the last local variable, that sum tells us the total number of bytes that we need to allocate for this particular function. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what local var size is representing? Okay, so sometimes I would abbreviate local var size as LVS, okay, because you know, otherwise you know, it's a long label. But in this case, I'm just gonna spell it out just so that we know what it is. So the label definition does not do a single thing on the stack, because remember, Label definitions are only things that are helpful to the assembler. It, is, it does not represent anything at runtime. It does not do anything to the stack pointer. It does not do anything to the stack itself. These are just saying, oh, from here on, if I see main underscore local var size, I will just consider that the same thing as the sum between those two other labels, which turned out to be just three, okay? <clears throat> so that means I still have to allocate that space you know, using actual opcode. So that would be done by LDIA main underscore local var size that uh, subtract that amount from D. This is for allocating for the local variable. Every time we allocate something, you always have to ask the question, who is going to deallocate? Because you know, it's like open paren and close paren. If you see an open paren, you always have to ask, where do I find the close paren? So in this case, I'm making the close paren here, which is right before the actual return code of main, which is LDBD, okay? That should be something that is super familiar at this point because that's just a usual way of returning. So all the code that I need would be between here because only at this point that the local variable is allocated, okay? And the um, label is truly representing where can I find the structure itself and then also where to find each member of the structure. So now we deal with line 14, 15, and 16. I, you know, the left-hand side is, e the right-hand side is easy. It's just a five. LDI A5, okay? That's the right-hand side of line 14 in the C code. The left-hand side seems a little bit, oh man, how do we do this? So this is where you need to go back to the picture. So let me go to well, there's a picture right here, okay? This is a picture, but I'm going to go back to the tablet to get you a better picture. Okay. So the way the stack looks like right now is we have a return address from main back to the entry point, and then we have three bytes allocated here. These three bytes together is cord, which is the local variable of main. Inside, we have the member X, the member Y, and the member Z arranged like this. So if you look at it this way, what about the labels? What are the labels trying to tell us? The stack point, so the label of um, X underscore X, okay, X underscore X is representing this. It is the offset from the beginning of a structure to member X, which is a zero because guess what? It is the first member. This is exactly, it is at the same byte, okay, as the beginning of the entire structure. What about X underscore Y? Well, that's where we would expect to find Y. So this distance here is X underscore Y because it is the offset from the beginning of the entire structure to where we find member Y. So Z, kind of the same thing, right? <clears throat> So Z is gonna be here, but it's coming from here. So this is X underscore Z, which is the offset, once again, in number of bytes from where the structure is 
to the member that we want to access. Are we still doing okay so far with this? All right. What about um, um, main underscore x, a uh, main underscore cohort? Main underscore cohort is relative to the stack pointer. It is not relative to the beginning of the structure. It is relative re is relative to where the stack point is pointing to. So that is what main underscore cohort is. It's, it is also an offset, but has nothing to do with structures. It has everything to do with how we use the stack for local variables. So is that okay? Is this picture doing okay so far? Okay. All right, so now what do we do? Well, we also have to point out where the stack pointer is. So the stack pointer is pointing right here, which is pointing to the first byte of you know, this entire structure. Okay, so how do we store something into member X of local variable cord? So I'll show you the long way and then we'll go for the shortcut, okay? So let's use register B and C you know, for the left-hand side, you know, for this part here. So it would appear that we need to know where cord itself is as a local variable. Uh, we kind of know how to do that. We cannot use register A because it's already representing the left-hand side, so we're gonna use register B here. Um, it's gonna be main cord. This is the offset from the stack pointer to the first byte of the local variable. This is now the address of cord. Now, so that means in the picture, now we know where to find the entire cord. It is starting here, okay? We have the address of the entire structure. Then we have to figure out, um, okay, so where do we find member X of the entire structure? Oh, you just have to add the offset of member X from the beginning of the structure to the address of the structure. Is that okay? So let's do that the long way and then we'll figure out the way to do it, you know, the shorter way to do this. Um, okay, I'm just double checking the recorder. Okay, pretty sure it's still working. Yep, we, we're still good. <clears throat> All right, so now we say, okay, LDIC with X underscore X, add register C to register B because register B already has the address of the entire thing. Now you can do it the other way too. You can kind of do it like this. Um, where register C now becomes the address of member X of the local variable cohort. So are we doing okay so far? Are we mapping the instruction sequence to the picture that I was showing a little bit earlier? And somebody's going to point out and go like, but tech, this is all pointless because main underscore cohort is a zero, X underscore X is also a zero. So we're adding zero to the stack pointer, and then we're adding zero to that stack pointer again. So what is the whole point? The whole point is if I choose to change the structure and I choose that X is no longer the first member of the entire structure, I don't have to change the assembly code at all. Okay, so this is prepping myself for any modification to the structure. If I insert additional members before X, like a W, I just have to change the definition slightly, but the rest of the program does not have to change at all. Okay, all right, so now that we have the address of member X of cohort in register C, we can now do the store. So STCA, oops, CA, that should do the store. So if I were you, you know, kind of testing this thing out, I would just stop here, okay, because I just need to make sure that the five is stored to the right location, okay? So let's go ahead and run this code as it is. But before we do that, we switch back to the template here, and we basically say, what are we expecting? We're expecting a five to be stored here, and this is location what? Um, this is, okay, this is FF, this is FE, FD, so, so this is location FC. So we're expecting location FC to change to a content, a value of five. That's what we're expecting when we run the code, so we are going to run the code now. Okay, go to, okay, there we go. Submit um, struct.ttpasm. It does not exist. Uh, did I save it? Nope. Typical, typical. 
<clears throat> All right, let's do it one more time. All right, so now we get back to the assembly code and then we go to the, oh, we're already here. So this code program is significantly shorter. So I'm gonna show you another trick here. If you know what you're expecting, you're expecting FC to get a value of five, you can search for that. So control F you know, can do that. Um, we are looking for FC to get a value of zero five, and there we have it. So that confirms you know, the way we do this, okay? So now this is the long way of doing this. We can go for the shortcut now. The shortcut of doing this has to do with recognizing that between the two adding, there's nothing else we do in between. So if you look at you know, how we perform, you know, we add main chord to you know, basically to D and it becomes a register B and then we add immediately you know, X underscore X to it. So that means, uh, so that means the whole thing can be shortcutted a little bit. Get rid of these two and then we'll do a constant add here. That would have done exactly the same thing, except I have to now remember that register B has what we need. So this is the shortcut of doing the same thing because between the two additions, we didn't do anything in between. There's no dereferencing in between. So as a result, we can just go like, oh, we can just collapse the two adds into one single one and just you know, compute both the offset to the beginning of the structure and the offset to the member that we need, combine those two into one and then just add the stack pointer to that combined offset on line 29, and we're done. So once again, I can claim all I want, but does this actually do what we think it should be doing? Let's test it, okay? So that's the whole idea behind you know, having the tool that makes this process a little bit easier. Okay, I just did something that I did not intend to do, but go back here, but the program is definitely saved, so now we just run it again. So having the convenience of you know, River Spider gives you the additional time instead of messing around with your know, discretion and all kinds of stuff like that. Now we can focus on the concept. So now this time, you know, this is uh, this is not done yet. Hmm. Okay, did I run into a problem? Nope, I did not run into a problem. And I'm pretty sure I changed it. Code. Oh, this is the wrong, wrong program. Let me go back to the struct program here. Okay. Uh, yep, I did change the program. So why is it not? Oh, I did. Okay, so this is correct. So, okay. We end up you know, at the same location because remember, main chord is a zero this time, x underscore is also x is you know, a zero this time. So we still end up with you know, the same um, value being put at the, into the same location. So that means you know, the, two piece, the two programs are truly equivalent. In this case, you can indeed change um, you know, from one form to the other one, saves yourself like two instructions or so. All right. So let me, I don't, I forgot my watch today. So we are at 11.30 right now. Okay. What about pointer to structures? How do we get those things done? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay. So this time we are switching back to the C code, but we're gonna make some modifications this time. So this time we're gonna say, well, main is gonna call another subroutine. We'll call this init uh, struct, okay init x, okay, so it's initializing a local variable x of some kind. And we are gonna pass the address of a structure here, so struct x, you know, um, ptr for pointer. <clears throat> and this time we'll do something like this, okay, we're gonna initialize the three members exactly the same way. So um, x gets five, y gets seven, and then z gets one. And then we take out this code here and then we make a function call to init x. But since it's expecting the address of a struct x, now we have to take the address of cohort here. And return zero back here. There we go. All right, so 
are there any questions about this new program, which is going to do almost exactly the same thing, but in a different way? Because now we use a subroutine to access whatever the point is pointing to, and then we change the member to a mem we change the member of a structure that the pointer is pointing to. Are we good so far? Is the C code okay? Because if we don't understand the C code, there's no point in talking about the assembly code. Okay, all right. And by the way, if you want to use a different alternative syntax, you can also look at this as dereferencing the pointer first and then accessing member Y of that. So lines 12 and 13 really mean the same thing, well, I mean accessing different members, but it's just a syntactical change. The pointer thing, a minus followed by a greater than symbol, is just for convenience. It just looks nice, okay? But it really means the same thing as a dereference and then accessing a member of. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna change the program on this side, okay, on the right-hand side. Um, I'm going to give you a different program. So I'm gonna use struct one.ttpsm. So this way you, know, you can kind of compare and contrast between the two programs. All right, so I'm gonna start super fast here, okay. And this is why syntax highlighting is helpful because it tells me, hey, you know, this is not gonna work for sure. Okay, and here's main. Main still has the local variable cord, so I still need those you know, definitions. So I'm gonna have a main underscore cord being a zero, main underscore LVS for local variable size is going to be main cord and X underscore size plus, and then we have to allocate a space for that, LDIA main underscore LVS, uh, subtract D, A from D, and then we have to undo that, deallocate, and then we do the usual return sequence, which is LDBD, increment D, ST, oh, JMPD. There we go. All right, so in between, we now have to push the address of cord on the stack and then push the return address and then call uh, jump to init X. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, LDIA with main cord. This is the offset, add AD, this is the address. We have to push it on the stack, decrement D, S, T, D, A. Now we have to push the um, return address, which is A dot six plus, decrement D, S, T, D, A. We push the return address. Continue execution at the subroutine init X. When it comes back, we got to clean up the stack because we still got that pointer living on the stack right now. So increment D will clean that up. And now we can get to the subroutine, which is init x. And we want to know what is on the stack. PTR is on the stack. Return address is one byte, one byte below that. So I will say init x, return address ADDR is a zero because that's where the stack point is pointing to. And then init x underscore PTR is init x return address one plus. So now I have labels you know, to designate everything that I need to access. And now we can go through the code. Um, but I would also end the program first. So use the LDBD, increment D, JMPD. All right, so in between, now I can actually do the code. So the first one is line 12, which is I want to store a five to member X of the structure the PTR is pointing to, okay? So I'm not storing to PTR, I'm storing to the structure that PTR is pointing to. All right, so the left-hand side, the right-hand side is easy, okay? That's just the right-hand side. The left-hand side, on the other hand, gets a little bit complicated this time. So you have to look at this and go like, what is the first thing that I need to access? <laughs> I, I don't need to deal with you know, the member first because I need to know where is the structure? Well, that means I have to get to PTR first. So now we do an LDI B with um, init X PTR. This is the offset from where the stack pointer points to, to get to pointer. Add BD, this is the address of pointer itself. LDBB 
this is the actual value of the pointer, which uh, probably is going to be useful from here on. I'm going to save it in register B, okay? And then we, ha we have to add to the address, okay? So at this point, on line 20 in the assembly code, register B is already the address of a structure that the caller has passed to me, okay? So at this point, if I want to access a particular member, I just have to add the offset of the member to the address of the entire structure, okay? So this time I do need a different register, which is LDIC this time, and this is X underscore X, which is the offset from the beginning of the structure, the address of the structure, to a specific member of that structure. And this time I'm gonna add mm, CB, because I want to preserve B in this case. So register C now contains the address of member X of the structure that the pointer is pointing to. All right, so this makes a great exercise for you guys to comment and to add you know, your comment you know, next to each and every single line. I mean, <clears throat> maybe not each and every single one because your know, line 18 and line 19, you know, even line 20, those are the things that you should be like super familiar by now. And if you're not, I would start to worry, okay? But the extra two lines, which is line 21 and line 22, that is important, okay? That has to do with accessing a member of a structure. Okay, so I got everything here. I just need to do a store, and that's it. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna finish this entire program. Register B is already the base or the, uh, at the address of the structure. So from here on, I really just need to, uh, I can do something even more funky. I can do something like this, LDI, I can reuse register. Well, let's register A is still going to be a. It's going to be a seven now. Question. Uh, where is X? Way earlier. Uh, you are right. I forgot. Okay, thank you. So X underscore X. I can just copy from the other one too. Let me just do that. Uh, so four lines, five lines here, and paste here. There we go. <laughs> I totally forgot. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so getting back to here. All right. So LDIC, which is the only register I have available at this point, is going to be um, X underscore Y. Okay, so this is a pretty classic way to do it. And then I just... Uh, There we go, okay? So now you know, when you are doing this, when you're going through this code, you have to remind yourself on line 32, what is in register B? You know, how can we just you know, shorten the whole thing to be like this instead of the longer sequence? You have to remember what register B still contains at that point of the program. All right, so that means you know, the next one is gonna be pretty much the same thing, except we are storing a one to member Z, but I'm making use of the fact that register B has always been, since line 25, has always been the address of the entire structure. So I'm just saying, oh, this is the address of the structure already. I'm just you know, going to different members of the very same structure. Are there any questions about this code? So if not, then we want to look at the, um, the picture, okay, what is supposed to be on the stack. So we're expecting a seven to be here, expecting a one to be here. But since we're calling another subroutine, so we are expecting um, this to be the address of cord. So this is the address of cord, which is FC. And then this is the return address again, in order for init X to return to main. So this is the, the full picture of the stack after this program runs. All right, so we'll go ahead and to go to the assembler. Oh, wait, I cannot do that just yet because I have to run it. Make sure it's saved. And then go to this prompt to run it. <clears throat> huh? Oh, you're right. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So when today's lecture is over, I will give you guys your struct.c, struct.ttpsm, and struct1 
.ttpsm. So this way you can kind of look at the code, and it would be a great starting point for you guys to start to comment and kind of so that you can you know get a better understanding of the code. All right, so this is what we're expecting, and let's see whether those are the changes that we see when we update the stack. So when we look at the stack, okay, we are looking for certain updates, and we can look for, let's look for the last one, okay, because we are looking for FE to become a one. So we're looking for FE to become a one, and that's exactly what we saw here, right? So, so this is a confirmation, okay? So we do also want to make sure that everything is, you know, uh, the stack pointer is back to zero and we get to the whole construction that we intend to get to. So all the, both of those are confirmed. So this program does indeed work the way it's supposed to. Are we okay this time? No. Let me look at the time. I don't have my watch, which is inconvenient. So we still got about seven, eight minutes today. So it is important to understand that this time, there's no short, shortcut. So if I go back to the assembly code and go to initx here, this time there's no short, shortcutting here. In other words, I cannot just say, oh, let's you know, put x, x here. That's, it's not gonna work because we have a D reference in between. So because of the D reference, we cannot combine the two ads and just go like, oh, we we'll just go for the constant ad so that we can save some runtime. We cannot save the runtime because the first ad is leading to a pointer, which we dereference, and then the second ad is on top of the dereferenced pointer. So we cannot combine the two ads this time. Are we okay so far? All right. So I will also, okay, let me just kind of pause a little bit longer and see if there are any questions. Okay. So is that sufficient? You know, is, it, is this length of awkwardness sufficient? Okay, very good. <clears throat> All right, so what we're going to do is now we look at the program that you need to do in a week, okay? So this is a week-long kind of project. Once again, get started early, okay? You know, starting with commenting this code that I just wrote, okay? Because that's going to be tremendously helpful. I think it's going to be helpful. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. All right, so the code that you are going to do, okay? Okay, so let me take a look at that. It's called Traverse, okay? This is the C code. This is the assembly code template for you to start with. And it complains because I have it open somewhere else. So we'll quit first. Uh, let me take a look at where did I put it? There we go. That's where it is. And we're going to look at the C code and the assembly code. There we go. All right, so we're going to focus on the C code first, and then the assembly code is kind of a little bit different later. All right, so when we look at the C code, the structure is called node this time, N-O-D-E with an uppercase. <clears throat> and we notice a few things that are kind of different this time. We have a member called L, okay, for left-hand side, and a member called R for right-hand side. But the type of these two members is like, can we really do this? Because they are pointers to struct node but we are in the middle of defining a struct node. Can this possibly happen? Well, let me ask you, what is the size of a pointer to an unsigned integer in TTPSM? It's representing an address, so it's one, byte. it's one byte, okay? Because one byte is enough to point to any location in RAM. Okay, what about a pointer to a structure that we just saw earlier in the other program? What is the size of, a, of, an, of the address of a struct x in the previous example. It's still one byte, okay? So the size of an address is always one byte. So that means, oh, it's perfectly okay here because I just need to understand that this is an address, so is this. They're both just one byte long. But what about the thing is pointing to? We don't have to worry about that, okay? We worry about that 
when we refer to that, okay? But we are not referring to that at all. So <clears throat> now um, inside your traverse, okay? So I need to stuff the body of traverse too. This is in your homework or in your, um, in your lab. So let me switch to the lab first because I want to show you a simplified version so that you don't you know, waste time doing something that you don't really have to do. So let me go back to the, all right, where is that? Right here. So this is the lab that you need to do you know, during the lab time. It's like three points, okay? They're all multiple choice. Well, not multiple choice, but they're, they're easy enough. All right, so the actual code inside Traverse is going to look like this, okay? But I can give you, no, this is already a shorter version. Okay, that's fine. Okay, compile, control C, and then paste over here. Control, shift V, there we go, okay. All right, so this is the complete C code. So we are combining a few things now, okay? So what we're combining is tr uh, recursion, okay? So, we, okay, first of all, do you find recursion difficult? Okay, in, in what way? Is it in the way of writing the code or in the way of debugging the code? There's a big difference between those two. Okay, so let's address one at a time, okay? So let's, let's break this down, address it one at a time. In terms of writing the code, not worrying about debugging, is recursion any harder than the usual calling and returning? It should not be, okay? So, so I see people turning their head, and that would be a good answer, okay? Because recursive call is just like, we're still calling a function, we go through exactly the same motion, pushing all the arguments, last argument first, push the return address, jump to the subroutine, come back, clean up the stack, clean, clean up all the arguments. That has nothing to do with are you calling the very same subroutine that you're in. You still do exactly the same thing. So from the perspective of what we need to do to call and return, it makes no difference whatsoever. Now, when it comes to debugging it, then yes, it can be a little tricky, and that's why you have to know what, what test cases to use to test it for, with first and then second and so on, okay? So it has that element of recursive call, okay? And it also has the element of accessing a member that is in a structure that a pointer, which is one of the parameters pointing to. But I just showed you, okay? I just showed you how to do that. So you have to basically look at all the pieces of sample programs that I have done in this class and then learn from those and then piece those things back together in order to solve this problem. So what you need to do is an analysis process, which is breaking things down, okay, and absorbing the, the, the actual mechanism, and then you go through you know, problem solving, which is a synthesis process of putting things back together. That is how most people you know, do deal with programming. Okay, so line 15 is a nasty line, okay, it looks pretty nasty. So one way to do this, I'm gonna give you a simplified version, is not to do the increment here, but down here. So that should make it look a little easier or even better. How's that? So the original code is exactly meaning this, except this one looks you know, a little bit easier to deal with. It specified the order of how to do things you know, in this case. But we know how to dereference. That's in the swap function. The swap subroutine already tells you, oh, you need to be able to dereference a parameter. Okay, we know how to do that. Do we know how to store to something that is dereferenced from a parameter? The swap function does that too, okay? Um, so other than that, this program, you know, the only thing that's kind of special is how do we deal with global variables? So N5 down to N1 are global variables. They are all of the type of struct node, and this is how we do initialized structures in C or C++. The equivalent thing is to do this in assembly. Okay, so we are, so N1, N1 is referring to the address of N2 as the first member. So in this case, we just refer to the label of N2, 
because the label of N2 is where do we find N2, so that's the address already. Then it has a member, a value of 5, a value of 5, and then we refer to the address of N3, which is just referring to the label of N3 here. Okay? Um, and when you look at main, in this case, it's just one single call to traverse, which is recursive, okay? All right, so the question is, how do you test this program? So I will give you three test cases. The first one is not to use N1. The first test case is to use N5. The reason why you, you want to use N5 or N4 is N5 or N4 does not have the left or the right you know, having any actual pointer value, so it's not gonna do any recursion. Okay, which means it will still go through the conditional statement, but it, you know, the recursion here is gonna be, it will do the recursive call, but it's not gonna do, single, do a single thing. Then we'll do line 15 and 16, and then we'll do another recursive call, which also is not gonna do anything. Now, if you really want to make sure that you have a good starting point, this is yet another starting point. I'm, going, I'm giving you all of these alternative starting points just so that you can debug your program in a very structured way. Start with this, okay? I'm passing a null pointer to begin with, which means pointer is null. I should not do a single thing because I will skip everything from line 13 all the way to line 18, which means the, the call does not do a single thing, okay? Then we start with N5 and then we'll do N3, because N3 only goes to one side, okay? <clears throat> and then when that is successful, you implement the other recursive call, and then you know, we will deal with, deal with N, uh, N1. So this is the suggested progression of how you debug this program. Now, in this case, you can't really use the same, you know, choose one, okay? You cannot do four consecutive calls in this case, because your pointer will be run out of space, and then you will end up correcting the stack corrupting the stack. So that means, you know, I'm just going to make it extra clear how you, what is the best way to test your program. All right, so let me take a look at the time. We're at 53, so we're past the lecture time, but this is what you need to do for this week. So next Monday is going to be the due date for this particular homework assignment. Um, some people might be able to find, you know, like previous solutions to the same homework assignment, but, you know, kind of close to it on the internet. But the, part, the, the thing is, you need to understand all of this stuff here, because I can guarantee you the final exam is going to involve all the same elements. But it's not going to be something that you can find on the internet, because I don't even know what I'm going to ask in the final exam. I just know what it's, it's going to consist of. All right. Are there any questions about this particular program? Okay, one more thing. You know, I know there's always this one more thing because I do want to show you what the program does, okay? So the best way to understand what this program is going to do <clears throat> is to test it. So testing the program means you go to, you use GCC, uh, traverse, okay, dash, G dash O, traverse, traverse, Let's see, GDB traverse, and then do a, put a, I'm just gonna put a breakpoint on line 38. I'm fairly confident that this is gonna work. Okay, so the program doesn't print a single thing. Everything, all the side effects is in array. So you have to look at array, and you can see, okay, I have no idea, idea, no idea what this is. This is a three, this is a four, this is a five, a tab is an eight, backslash n is a 10. You can always print out individual elements as well. It's a little tedious, okay? You can say what is at location zero, location one, and so on. So, so now that you know the program is supposed to do this with n1 as the parameter, the next thing you want to do is to try it out with just a zero. The other thing you also want to test is where is array point, what is array pointer pointing to? So if you look at array pointer, it is now at four zero, which is one byte past. Um, is it one byte past? Yeah, it is one byte past the end of the array itself, okay? Because I can now print what is the address of array. It's a B, so you just count, right? Okay, array has five elements. So we have B, C, D, E, F. 
f is the last location of the array, but the array pointer is now pointing one byte past the end of array. Your assembly code should do the same thing. Okay. Um, one more test case. You know. <clears throat> Well, I can afford to spend some time here because you know, the, the actual lab for today is really short. Okay, it's not going to take up much time. So, oh, okay, that's not the right one. Let's look at this one here. Okay, so if you are to try the other test cases, what should you get? Right, you know, let's try this one. So if you try this one, then array would still be uninitialized. Okay, so you should not find any specific value. And then array pointer, which is a local variable of main, would remain pointing to the very beginning of the entire array because we could not get into the then portion of the conditional statement. Okay, so that's how you test the code. You use the C code to help you get a better understanding of what it is supposed to do. Use GDB for that purpose so that you can say, okay, this is the simplest test case. What is it supposed to do? And then in your assembly code, just handle the conditional statement, okay? Forget about all the, the entire block of your 14 to 17. Just say that, okay, I just need to know whether pointer is no or not. If it is not no, we're going to do this. If it's no, I'm not going to do anything, okay? So use that, okay? You can always put a halt instruction in place of line 14 to line 17 so that if you do get into the then portion, you go like, oh, I'm not supposed to be here, okay? So that way you can debug your, the logic of the conditional statement first. Once you get a conditional statement done, then you implement those things just basically one thing at a time. Is that okay? All right. Um, I have I can talk about this and not for another hour, okay? But I don't want to because I know you guys need the time to actually do the lab and actually go in and you know kind of comment the program that I have written today. So I'm going to stop the lecture unless there are questions that you want me to answer before I stop the recorder. Go ahead. No, this is a tree. <laughs> we, yeah, this is something that uh, people get into in the CISP 430. But I can put it here because I'm giving you the code. I'm not asking you to write the code in C. I'm asking you to translate that code into assembly. So it's a whole different thing. All right. So I'm going to pause. And any other questions before I stop the recorder? All right. If there are no questions, I'll start stop the recorder. And then I'll send you the code that I just mentioned today. Um, and you guys can get started with the um, lab activity. Let me get you the, uh, the access code. You can actually get started. So I think we're in it already, and I have to make it publish it. And then the access code, oh, there's no access code? There must not be any access code. All right, so you should be able to see it and get into it. I don't think there's any access code to it. Yep, there's no access code. So you have until 120 to turn this in. But I would advise you to spend the rest of today's lab just kind of go over the programs that I did go through today and see if you have any questions when I'm in the lab to be able to answer those questions. All right. So I think that's that. And I'll release the uh, submission interface as well, which is for next Monday at 10.30. So next Monday is the 4th of December. <clears throat> 